So I would like to talk a bit about um, filtering on Linux bridges. As an introduction, I would first like to review what we currently have in place in the kernel. So the bridge module, basically just like the INET and IPv6 stack, places a couple of hook points at strategic places uh, in the bridge path, for instance, we have a bridge pre-routing, which is a bit of a misnomer because it should actually be a pre-bridging um, code because the bridge obviously doesn't do routing. And um, just like the init stack, we can register callbacks that are invoked at these locations and the callbacks can then decide on what to do with the packet, just something like dropping or continuing on to the next rule. This is an overview, we have five hooks, just like with IPv4, IPv6, the only major difference is that if in the case of local delivery, the packet will obviously end up in the IPv4, IPv6 stack first and we will also traverse the IP tables or IP6 tables or NF tables um, IP rules. The current state was EB tables, which, which is the old tool that we have in place for filtering. It's basically it was cloned off IP tables more than a decade ago and hasn't seen a lot of development since then. It only has a couple of stateless matches. For instance, you can match on VLAN ID or the packet type or the packet mark. And it has some rudimentary support for stateless uh, network address translation on the MAC addresses. There are no stateful matches. There is no connection tracking, nothing at all. And even worse, the EB tables code can't even call into generic X tables targets or modules. So all the functionality that you, that you want in EB tables, you have to copy and paste into, the, into an EB tables module. What we do have instead is something that's called call IP tables. There is a module called BridgeNet filter. And if you load that, then you can um, tell the bridge code to do an up call into the generic IP or IPv6 um, net filter code path. The upside is that we gain access to all the functionality that we, ha that we have in IP tables, for instance, connection tracking and network address translation. But the downside is that there are actually many, many problems with that approach, uh, especially some subtle race conditions and other things because um, obviously the, the IPv4 net filter pass assumes that it's called from the IP pass and not from the bridge pass. So we have to do save and restore operations on the SKB control buffer because it's owned by the bridge layer and not by the INET layer. There are some usability issues, for instance, um, in EB tables, the input interface is the bridge port, and in IP tables, it will be the bridge itself, so the logical interface. There is, VLAN is very messy because um, um, to do VLAN up calls, we have to, uh, to remove the VLAN header and software from the bridge net filter module and do the up call. Uh, because a router it does not care what VLAN is or what Ethernet is, it only looks at um, the network and transport headers. So if you want to do VLAN header on a, a VLAN filtering on a, on a normal router, you would just look at the input interface name and not care what the, ac the actual type is. <coughs> Connection tracking is supported or available with this call IP tables and the good news is it will actually work unless there are some special cases involved. So for instance, it will not really work if you have different bridges or VLANs that share overlapping IP addresses because contract has no notion of interfaces or um, different um, VLAN IDs. So um, if you do it, there will be problems because we will erroneously match packets as established even if they are from a completely unrelated connection because to the contract engine it will look as if they are the same when they are not. If you use NFQ, then you will basically always get kernel crashes sooner than later because uh, with NFQ that means the packet is, uh, will be, uh, will be um, checked asynchronously and unfortunately the um, design of the contract engine takes advantage of certain things that will never happen in a router, but it will happen in a bridge, for instance, when packets have to be flooded to several ports uh, at once and we just clone SKBs. And 
We also have very ugly code to cope with network address translation in the bridge. So for instance, if the bridge, co bridge net filter code detects that the IP address has changed, it has to do a relook lookup of, um, of the neighbor cache to query for a new destination MAC address and things like that. So we have all these layering violations with um, invoking routing, uh, routing code from the bridge. And furthermore, to cope with all of this, um, the SKP, uh, SKP data structure has an extra pointer to store various extra information such, uh, such as the bridge import, the bridge out port, and some scratch space to uh, store original headers that are only used because of this call IP tables mode and we could just remove that as well if we could find a way to do without call IP tables. And so in summary, if you want to do filtering on a bridge, you basically always have to do both EB tables and IP tables because they are basically completely distinct feature sets. We have long-standing stability problems that really can't fix other than adding extra locking to contract itself, which is brain dead because it's not, this locking is not needed for the no normal routing case. And um, traditionally the net filter hooks are always per network namespace and not per, bri not per bridge or interface. So if you have uh, 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 a system that has a lot of virtual machines and you have 100 or 200 bridges and you only need filtering on a single bridge, then all packets that traverse any bridge will pay the extra hook invocation overhead. So there are two major features that are missing from NF tables to, uh, for, for the NF tables bridge family. One is NFQ. NFQ means that you can pass a packet to user space via a netlink socket, and then user space can drop or accept the packet asynchronously. It can also rewrite or replace packet payload. NFQ itself is a family agnostic, but there is a backend connect, uh, connected to it that is currently limited to IP or, or and IPv6 because the backend has to do things like check if user space changed the IP address and then it has to do rerouting and things like that. From a user space point of view, you basically get a netlink message with some attributes such as the family or the hook that queued the packet, the input and output interface indexes, uh, the packet NF mark, and of course the packet payload. And the packet payload will always start from the network header because we will just take everything from SKP data until to the end and show that to user space. So any layer two information is also lost. So to implement that for a bridge, the most simple solution would be to just push and pull the Ethernet header right before we um, create the netlink message to user space so that user space would simply see um, um, a payload that starts with the, uh, with the Ethernet header instead of the network header. But unfortunately, on second thought, that does not work so well because on Linux, we always do VLAN header strip stripping. So if it's a VLAN, then user space would not see the VLAN header at all. So we would have to either untag and uh, stuff the VLAN header back, which is a bit of silly because we have to undo work that we already did. And we also can't really detect when uh, user space has changed the L2 header, such as in inserted a new VLAN header or whatever, because we would have to pull a different amount of bytes back to fix up the um, SKB data pointer again. So, it's, uh, so it seems preferable to just add new netlink attributes for uh, storing the layer 2 header and the VLAN header. And the bonus point for doing that, um, we would get basically native or ingress family support for free as well, because um, if we do NFQing on ingress, then obviously user space would have to implement all possible layer two headers to skip to the network header. But if we keep it as a separate attribute, then user space doesn't need to uh, know any special things about the layer two header, and it will basically just work. So the plan, as already said, just add new attributes and then uh, use SKP MAC header and push that to user space. For VLAN, we will do the, pretty much the same thing. So we will just serialize the metadata that is stored in the SKB instead of untagging. 
and that would later all, also allow user space to add or insert VLAN headers. So the kernel would just have to check, for instance, if there is a uh, if if a if a new VLAN attribute has appeared or if there is a VLAN attribute with a zero length to remove VLAN and so on. So while I don't plan to implement that at the moment, at least with that design, we would not prevent us in any way from later adding such support. Next problem, overlapping addresses. So originally I thought we might be able to solve that in, a, in an automatic way, but it turns out that it's not so nice to resolve these problems. Um, we can already partially work around it with IP tables with the contract target by stuffing the contracts that have overlapping addresses into distinct zones. The zone is basically just a 16-bit identifier that is taken as an additional key when doing contract lookups. So even if the on-wire addresses are the same, a lookup would no longer find the other um, conflicting tuple. It requires manual setup, and it's not very efficient uh, when you have lots of VLANs because IP tables um, has linear evaluation, so if you have 1,000 VLANs and you want to stuff those in 1,000 distinct zones, you need 1,000 rules. But yeah, fortunately, we now have NF tables, and it's not really a problem with NF tables. So as I said, we could try an automatic extraction of the VLAN ID and use that as an initial key. But um, if, for instance, you would want to do connection tracking not with, v with VLAN, <laughs> but with IP packets embedded, say, inside PPPoE frames, then you would have to do kernel changes, and that's not really ni nice. Furthermore, overlapping addresses could also happen with distinct bridges instead of just um, different VLANs, so that doesn't work either. So it doesn't seem too bad after all to just enforce manual configuration for this. And in NF tables, we don't have the linear rule set problem anyway because you can just use things like maps to, um, for instance, map VLAN IDs to zones or input interfaces or whatever. For connection tracking on the bridge, um, the plan is basically to add a um, contract expression <laughs> that serves as an, uh, has um, two functions. So it, first of all, it would tell the kernel that it now has to do connection tracking in this, uh, in the given hook. So we would not have to, to enable contract unconditionally like we do now with the um, IP or IPv6 stack. And it will also serve as the ingress point. So you could, for instance, restrict um, connection tracking to particular subnets and not have the overhead for all the traffic that's, uh, that's tr uh, crossing the bridge. The problem is that um, you would still need some unconditional um, hooks for things like confirmation. Basically, the confirmation is um, for um, a new packet. We don't commit the contract to the main table right away, but we first remember it locally. And so that if the packet is going to be dropped, we don't have the overhead of committing it um, f uh, to the full table. So the confirmation just happens at the end of the rule set traversal. If there was no drop, then we can put it into the table. But we also have things like helpers, and um, we have to detect, uh, have, we have to do things like detect when a packet is related to an exist existing connection that affects, for instance, IPv4 pass MTU. So you, um, you can't really expect that a user knows what kinds of packets will possibly match the, um, the traffic that the user wants to do connection tracking with. Uh, also, a big difference will be that there will be no um, tracking from the bridge for outgoing connections because if you have locally generated traffic, then it will already have passed through the IP and IPv or IPv6 stack, so they are, those are already tracked anyway. So basically, all that we need is a kind of um, in, uh, on, in, on the input path. We just have to basically look at SKB protocol and then do an up call either into the IPv4 or IPv6 connection tracking engine. So we would end up with something like this. We would have to add uh, in post routing, which should really be post bridging, but okay, helper and confirmation hooks. 
confirmation to com just commit to the main table and helper to um, make sure that if we have things like FTP or a SIP or whatever, that we can create the appropriate um, entries in the expectation table to correctly decode traffic that is not directly directly matching the tuple but somehow related to the traffic. For instance, the voice channel in SIP. Um, we would have to add something to pre-routing to handle reply traffic. So, um, so we can also, for instance, handle and um, IP defragmentation there. We would not, uh, not do anything in input because, as I already mentioned, if the traffic is for the local bridge, then we will do an up call into the IP stack anyway. And so we can handle that with the code we already have in place. So one question that we are, we are sometimes confronted with is, how you can disable defragmentation on a particular interface. And the answer is that in IP tables or um, IP6 tables, you cannot do that because once the NFD frag IP something module is loaded, defragmentation just happens automatically for all traffic that is passing a router. And um, in IPv4 and IPv6, um, there is a phony de or pseudo dependency from contract on defragmentation, so if you load the contract module, the defrag module is loaded automatically as well, although there is no technical, strict technical reason for doing that. We just have to do that to make sure that we can correctly look up any uh, transport header, because if you wouldn't do defragmentation and you have fragments, then you can't tell if they match any traffic that you already have on the contract table. So, um, we kind of have this conflict between usability and have it automatically and configurability with, uh, to do things like I don't want defragmentation on this particular interface. So the best idea so far to get out of this is to also add a defrag expression. So uh, that users could, for instance, say, please do not do, um, please only do defragmentation if, it's, if the packet is not arriving on a particular interface. So, um, to, depending fully on this, however, doesn't really play nice with contract-related handling because, um, as I already said, if you have a fragment, then you have no idea if it matches an expectation or a, an existing connection. So, um, it seems best to basically um, add such an, a defrag expression so that if you do not, don't, do not need contract at all and, for instance, just want to do NFQ, then you can use the defrag expression to have a fully programmable um, defragmentation process, but once you uh, depend on contract and ask for connection tracking, then the defrag would still be forced on by default everywhere, because as I already said, if we don't do it, we will end up in situations where we can't match packets to contract entries. So what's pending? I'm currently in the process of implementing this as outlined uh, in the slides. And I will try to avoid um, dependencies. So if you do um, connection tracking on the bridge, it will not auto load, for instance, the IPv6 contract module. And it will depend on the user to load the appropriate la layer 3 tracker. Um, I'm not planning to add net support. Because once you do a network address translation on a bridge, you always force the user to also add a, a full routing table so that we can figure out where to send the packet to. For instance, if you do not, it could mean that the packet has to leave not via the bridge, but via some completely unrelated interface. And that was always confusing to users who wonder why their transparent proxy isn't working and you have to tell them, yeah, you have to uh, add IPv6 uh, routes for that to work, things like that. So um, to do get net, you could still, um, for instance, use um, the user set expression to change the MAC address to the local MAC address and then have the packet pushed up to the IP stack to enter the normal routing path to solve that. So any questions? Yeah. I will try to repeat the question. More like a dependency of a SIP. At least in kernel 2.6, we 
you encountered a lot of problems. Oh, thanks. Uh, um, at least with kernel 2.6, we encountered a lot of problems when um, users would open a lot of uh, SIP connections and the connection tracking uh, SIP by default would, I don't remember the, the limit for the connections, but uh, the timeout for removing the connections from the connection tracking table would be something like one hour or five hours, something really humongous, and we would just end up that because we had so many SIP calls, we just start to run out of uh, connections in the connection tracker, and we just drop SIP, SIP calls. And uh, just to give you a tip, if, if you're gonna get it again into you know uh, making connection tracking for SIP calls, uh, try not to get into this pitfall and limit the timeout to something more reasonable than hours, something like you know one minute. Make the default, uh, you know, the syscontrol default for the number of connection tracking big enough, and uh, just you know maybe think of some, some maybe better plan to handle the case when you run out of connection tracking. Maybe bypass the connection tracking rather than drop zip calls. Yeah. Okay. We could check the behavior of the early drop code, but I would have to revisit that. You can, you can also, um, there is a timeout infrastructure, so you can specify different timeouts to, you can specify a, a timeout policy for traffic that you need. We have city timeout thing, probably it's going to um, avoid the problems that you are noticing with high timeouts while keeping the same, the default timeouts for the remaining flows. Yeah, there, there, we, we, we had the, there are sys controls that we used to, to bypass it, but uh, I'm just giving this a tip because sometimes when you start implementing stuff, you do not suspect when you uh, launch a product out that this is the result, and and you go out and then suddenly you get into you know uh, some situation where a combination of uh, a few conditions. And, and make the you know uh, the the product dysfunctional to to some point, and the, the tip is not how you know I'm not looking of how to bypass it and just how to correctly design the system in ahead to prevent new users or new programmers who are not aware of uh, exactly how things are implemented in a Linux kernel to get in the same pitfall again. So, this is mainly that. Yeah, then, then if I understand correctly, the problem is with the SIP, the SIP helper, right? Yeah. So the, 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 it will be good to debug um, what, um, to debug the C helper and with, with the product that is interacting with it to see what is not, not, not being interpreted the right way. I mean, the SIP proxy is basically parsing the SIP messages. It's a quite intensive task. It's string matching and so um, probably there is something in the in, in some of the uh, cell phone or hard phones that you're using or or the PVX that is not it's not uh, that that the that the helper is not liking for some reason. So it, it would be good to to debug um, to to get to the C product that is causing the problem and debug the the helper and, and find the reason so we can fix it. No, what, what what I mean is even if if the SIP is okay, I mean there is an uh, automatic tracking, and and once you start tracking SIP calls, they are allocated uh, one con uh, connection tracking uh, entry in the table, and then it's, it stays there for at least one hour. I don't remember the exact timeout. Even if everything is okay, and then you make another call, another call, and, and table just start to grow until you run out of. Uh, 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 entries, connection tracking entries, and then th uh, the next SIP call you want to open, yeah. there are n no more uh, free entries to add to the tables, we just have to drop calls. Um, yes, um, and the SIP, I mean, uh, currently we, we have, we can also, the, uh, you can disable the automatic, the automatic SIP helper assignment. Uh, there is a proc entry that is currently enabled by default. And the plan is to, because of problems that Eric LeBlanc and other people um, found on this automatic helper th 
thing uh, from a security point of view. The plan, it's been already uh, enabled. This behavior, the behavior that we have, it's been enabled for already quite a long time. So the plan is to disable that behavior. So user has to explicitly indicate what helper they need for what kind of flows. Is that what you need? Yes, if, if the default would be a off, I think it would be better because I, I know how to bypass it, but you know once Good. you know it's shipped to a customer and the customers start complaining yeah. and then telling him to, to start uh, making its an embedded system and start making all kinds of uh, setting to the sys control or the proc file system right. or whatever it's uh, you know yeah that's another good, good for business that's another good reason to disable it i mean we we have already more good reasons to di disable this automatic stuff and so so um, the default, default behavior should be changed anytime soon to <laughs> to request users to i mean we've been um, we've been announcing this for a long time, uh, changing this behavior, and so we probably are ready. It's been, I don't know if it's three, four years already, so we're probably ready to, to move. Thank you. So, any other question? Okay, thank you, Florian.